And I uh, hope you're anxious to hear from God's Word what a privilege it is for us to be able to look at words that have come to us down out of heaven. Jesus said, I don't say anything unless my Father tells me to say it, and I don't do anything unless I see my Father doing it. And so it's quite the little miracle that we can hold in our hands words that have come from Creator God down to His creation to tell us what His plans are for the world, what His plans are for us, and what it takes to please Him. Uh, You can be turning in your Bible to Matthew chapter 5, and we are going to be continuing to look at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to look at verses 21 through 26, and I titled this sermon, Building a Fence Around the Law. Building a fence around the law. You know, what comes to my mind is anybody that's got a swimming pool, it seems like uh, in the last several years there's been all kinds of rules and regulations about if anybody gets into your swimming pool and has an accident, it's your fault. So you had to build a six-foot fence and you had to do all these things to keep people away from your swimming pool. It was your responsibility to not let some stranger into your pool. And that's kind of uh, why I chose that title. Uh, And hopefully by the end of the sermon, you'll understand how Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is basically teaching His disciples to build a fence around the law. And that's what we're going to look at. Last week, He said, unless your righteousness surpasses the righteousness of the Pharisees, you'll never be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And uh, we talked about how there were three aspects to that sermon last week, an antithesis, a new era, and a caveat. The antithesis is there's a righteousness that God requires of His disciples. God has always said, I am a holy God. Therefore, you must be holy. And so the antithesis is, uh, look at the people that were leading them back in that day, the Pharisees, and these people are fake, He said. These people teach you the law of Moses, so you have to do what they tell you to do, but don't do what they do, because they're hypocrites. And so he compares, and we're going to look at that. The second aspect was we're in a new era. He said, in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, something that is coming, something that is on its way, and as a matter of fact, uh, a little bit later in Matthew, Jesus is going to say it's already here. Matthew chapter 12, Jesus was healing the sick. Jesus was raising the dead. Jesus was having victory over Satan's evil devices. And they accused him of being Satan himself, Beelzebub, or doing these miracles by Satan's power. And Jesus qualifies it, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 28. If I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. We are in this era where Christ has victory over Satan. The plan of Satan, the devices of Satan can no longer reign in the world because Christ the Messiah has come and He has victory over all of Satan's devices. So there's this new kingdom that is here. You definitely want to be a part of it. And the caveat is you can't be a part of it unless you crave righteousness, a true and genuine righteousness. This kingdom was announced by uh, Daniel in various places, chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 12, and uh, he says that in the days of those kings, God is going to fix everything. God is going to... uh, Bring a kingdom, and in the days of those kings was during the time of the Roman Empire, God would set up His kingdom. We knew that John the Baptist would be a forerunner to tell us it was coming, and now we have Jesus telling us it's here. But I want to take you to one of the sermons that Peter had mentioned about the authority of Christ, the authority of a new king, since we now have a brand new kingdom. Uh, Peter, in Acts chapter 3, Luke records Peter's sermon about Jesus, and we'll look at it, Acts chapter 3 and verse 22. 
And if you're interested, you can cross-reference. This quote is coming from Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. But, but uh, Peter goes back to Deuteronomy to say, this is who Jesus is. Acts 3.22 Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers, and you should listen to him. Whatever he tells you, and it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. Peter talks about Jesus and says Jesus is the prophet that was promised to us in the law of Moses, Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. Jesus is that prophet, and He said, Moses is your prophet for now, and He's going to give you the law, but one day I'm going to send you a prophet like Moses, and when that day comes, the law will be pushed aside, and you should listen to that prophet. You should listen to that prophet that I will send, and Peter makes it clear that Jesus is that prophet, but here is something so important about the words of Jesus. This same caveat is... Anybody that will not listen to Him will be cut off from the people, will be destroyed. Jesus Himself demanded this kind of obedience. Uh, it's in John chapter 3. You might want to turn to that, but John chapter 3 is where the most beloved verse in the Bible is. You'll be familiar with it. John 3.16 for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son so that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. And that's probably the only verse you've ever heard quoted from John chapter 3, but that's just the beginning of the statement. This doesn't fix everything. The rest of John chapter 3 says this unfortunately doesn't fix everything because there is a problem with the people of the world. When we get down to chapter to verse 19, the summary is in verse 19. Here it is, and this is the judgment. Here is the verdict of the situation. Light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. Everyone who does wicked things hates the light. They don't come to the light unless His works should be exposed. So God loves the world so much that He sent Christ as an atonement so that whoever would believe in Him could have eternal life, could experience salvation. But the problem, He says, with the world is that God sent this light into the world, but the world is in love with wickedness. The people in the world are in love with their abominations, and so they don't want to listen to the light. They don't want to obey Deuteronomy 18.18. 18, whatever He says, you better do. And He says people have a problem with that because they love the wicked things that they're involved in. So there's a problem in the world. God loves the world and wants to save the world, but the world is in love with wickedness, so there is a problem. And then he draws a final conclusion in verse 36. You want to turn to that. He draws a final conclusion in verse 36 where he gives the remedy to John 3.16, if you believe in Jesus, you can have eternal life. But he adds something here, John 3.36, whoever believes in the Son will have eternal life. But whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So it's important that we listen to Jesus' words especially here in the Sermon on the Mount, because Jesus is saying, here is how you fulfill the righteousness that God requires. The rest of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is going to be teaching people, here is what you've heard in the past. 
But here is how you need to go forward in the future. Jesus is going to be teaching the disciples the difference between the righteousness that comes from a written code, the Mosaic Law, and He's going to update them. He's going to prepare their mind and their spirit to understand the righteousness that comes by the Spirit. Uh, before we get into what Jesus is saying in His sermon, I want to take you back to Romans. Turn to Romans 6. And I'm just going to give you a quick overview of Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8. If a person could read chapters 6, 7, and 8 of Romans quickly and together and, and see how it's one big story, you would get what I would call the theology of righteousness. The theology of righteousness. So Jesus is going to teach us how to do it. Jesus is going to teach us how do we go from the written code to setting our mind on the Spirit and not the written code. Jesus gives us a how-to, but what's interesting is Paul in Romans 6, 7, and 8 just teaches us the theology of leaving behind the written code and setting our mind on the Spirit. Paul is going to give us the theology. Jesus is going to give us the how-to. So let me just skim right through Romans 6, 7, and 8 and highlight this idea. In the beginning, uh, because of the death of Christ, the death of Christ became our death to sin. Let's look at it. Romans 6 and verse 1. Are we to continue in sin so that grace can abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Paul seems to be having to explain the theology of righteousness because people were still enslaved to sin. And he goes, it shouldn't be that way because don't you realize what happened at your baptism? When you were baptized into Jesus Christ, you were baptized into His death. His death became your death and you died to sin. Let's go on in verse 4. We were buried therefore with Him by baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we can walk in a newness of life. I would put a square around the word walk. Because of our baptism into the death of Christ, we died to sin, and now we can walk in a brand new way. If you choose to read 6, 7, and 8 together, I would look for the word, now we walk, because it comes up several times. And it will really help train our mind to say, we used to walk by the written code. But now we walk differently. We died to the written code. Now we walk by the Spirit. We're going to see that. So now we're going to walk in a newness of life. Let's go to chapter 7, verse 5. Having died with Jesus, we died to what made us a slave to sin. What made people a slave to sin was the written code, the Mosaic Law. So we start in verse 5. While we were living in the flesh, he's talking about a previous time when you were under the Mosaic law, trying to be righteous by the written code. Uh, while we were in the flesh, our sinful passions were aroused by the law. And these passions were at work in our members, in our body, to bear fruit for death. But now... Since you've been baptized into the death of Christ, now we are released from the law because we died to that which held us captive so that we could serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. I hope you guys will take this to heart. Understand there's an old way and there's a new way. 
The old way was the written code. The old way was the Mosaic law. And we're going to, Jesus is going to show us the old way. And he says, but we don't worship that way anymore. We worship in the new way of the Spirit. Just to give you an idea where I'm headed with this, not the old way of the written code, but in the new way of the Spirit, when Jesus goes through His Sermon on the Mount and He says, you have heard it said this. Jesus is talking about the old way of the written code. But I tell you, do this. Jesus is going to give us the how-to to to this theology that Paul creates. We no longer do it this way. Now we do it this way. So now we worship by the Spirit, not in the old way of the written code. Turn to chapter 8 and let me kind of put a bow on this. Romans chapter 8 and verse 3. Why are we no longer serving in the old way of the law? Why do we no longer look at Moses' Torah to dictate our behavior? And he says, for this reason, verse 3, because God has done what the law, because it was weakened by your flesh, could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us. Even though we're no longer under the law, the righteousness that the law required is fulfilled in the New Testament Christian, the person that has been baptized into Christ, because you've died to sin, you no longer serve God that way, now you serve in the new way of the Spirit. So you are meeting the righteous requirement of the law. So there it is. What is this new way of the Spirit, not the old way of the written code? And with that little introduction, we get into our sermon. Jesus is going to show us the difference. Jesus is going to show us the difference by saying, you have heard it said, which is the old way of the written code, but now I tell you to do it this way, which is the new way of the Spirit. So let's go to Matthew chapter 5. And we'll begin in verse 21. Matthew 5 and verse 21. You have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Now, a person might look at that and wonder, how is that supposed to help? God said, don't kill anybody. I'm good with that. But now he's saying, no, the new thing is don't be angry with anybody. And it appears on the surface that that didn't make it easier. It made it harder, right? It appears like Jesus requires more than the law did. And so if the law was difficult to uphold... How is this new idea of not even getting angry, how is that easier? How are we going to be more able to do that? And I want to suggest that that's not what Jesus is trying to do. Jesus is trying to teach a person where the true source of righteousness lies. The true source of righteousness is not looking at words on a page and saying, okay, technically I've never done that. Technically I've never killed anybody, so technically I'm fine. And yet we find ourselves going right up to the verge of wanting to kill somebody. And Jesus says the way you meet the righteous requirement of the law is you build a fence around the law so that you don't get anywhere near breaking the law. Rather than the old way of the written code going, okay, here's the law, so I can get right up close to it, I can get right as close, but, but, but I still technically didn't break the law. 
And Jesus says, no, don't look at it that way. Jesus teaches us, look at it this way. Breaking the law is what happens in your mind. If you want to stay far away from breaking the law, work on your mind and your heart. And the way you do that is go, okay, in order for me to never violate God's commandment, I'm going to stay as far away from violating that commandment as possible. And the way you do that is with your, with your heart and your mind. And Jesus says, make this your, your, your boundary. Don't even get angry with somebody. Now we know anger is something that comes on us in a flash, but Jesus says, you work on that. Let your focus, let your, your new way of worshiping in the spirit is to control the things that are happening in your mind and in your heart. Don't just think about what you're doing with your hands as breaking the law. Think of what you do with your mind and your heart is how you stay far away from breaking that law. There was a law that you could uh, whip someone 40 times when they broke the commandments. It was a punishment. But there was a danger that said, do not ever whip someone more than 40 times because that would degrade the person. So do you know the rule that they made up for themselves so that they would never break the law? You only whip them 40 minus one. 40 lashes minus one. Why minus one? That way you never worry about breaking the law. You stay far away from breaking the law. And that's the difference between the old code, worshiping in the old way of the written code, the new way of the Spirit. The Pharisees would draw these really fine lines about, well, I didn't, I didn't kill anybody, didn't do anything wrong, but they were getting right up to the point, and that's not what God wanted. That's not the righteousness God wants. God wants us to not even, not even be pushing the boundaries, not even be pushing the limits. Control what's happening in your heart and in your mind. Don't even get angry with someone because even that could bring judgment on you. I want to give you guys a couple examples of understanding this. When I was little, I remember we had a couple Bible classes as teenagers, the awkward, awkward Bible class on how to uh, be sexually pure as a teenager. I won't ask you to raise your hands, but I don't know if you remember that awkward time when you're sitting in a class and you're talking about what is okay and what is what crosses the line in sexual impurity, and the nature that the class took on was the discussion became, well, what about this? Can you do this and still be sexually pure? What about this kind of kissing? Okay, what about this kind of kissing? Is this kind of kissing? Okay, what about this? What about uh, being in the backseat of a car, but you're still sitting up? Is that still sexually pure or is that? Or you, and, and the nature of the class was to have a discussion. How much can you do before it's considered sexually immoral? Can you see how that's the old way of the written code? The conversation amongst teenagers was, ooh, can I get away with this? Okay, you can do this. Oh, yeah, you can sneak this in, but oh, don't do this. And that's the problem. That's the old way of the written code. And what Jesus wants to teach us is, hey, the sin, the righteousness happens in your mind and in your heart, not in what you're doing with your hands, but what you're doing with your mind and your heart. So if you want to remain, the class should have been, if you want to remain sexually pure as a teenager, not how close can I get, it's how far away can I stay? It's not a discussion about what kind of kissing is okay, what kinds of things with your hands is okay. No, it's a discussion about in your mind and your heart, how far away can you stay from anything that might look like impurity? That should have been the discussion. And that's where Jesus is taking us. That's where Jesus is training His disciples. There was a scripture that I wish we would have seen as teenagers, Song of Solomon uh, chapter 8 and verse 40, he says, here is how you protect sexual purity. Daughters of Jerusalem, I adjure you, do not arouse or awaken love until the time is right. Don't arouse or awaken anything. 
I don't care if you're sitting in the front seat of a car next to a, a person of the opposite sex. If stuff is starting to happen in you, you need to take that person home. You need to get out of the car because he says, don't even come anywhere near. Don't awaken anything in your body until it's time. Well, when is the time? After you're married. That's the time. Then after you're married, it's okay to let that stuff open the doors to that stuff. But before marriage, don't do anything to awaken. Stay as far away from it as possible. And the way you do that is by controlling your heart and your mind. The Bible says Job was a righteous man. Turn to Job chapter 31. Job was a righteous man. Now, Job had the Mosaic law. Don't commit adultery. So that's what he should have been focused on. But look, even before Jesus taught us that true righteousness happens in your heart and in your mind, even before Jesus taught that, there were righteous people in the Bible who already had figured out what they wanted to offer to God. And so Job, a righteous man, in order to not be tempted by sins, makes a pact with his eyes. Let's look at it. Job 31 and verse 1. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. For what is our lot from God above? What is our heritage from the Almighty on high? He's saying, what does God expect of His creation? Verse 3, is it not ruin for the wicked and disaster for those who do wrong? We don't hear that preached very often, but when people are engaged in wickedness, Job said, I want to stay as far away from that as possible because we understand God. We understand God, and God says, what I have in mind is ruin for the wicked and disaster for those who do wrong. And Job says, I'm very aware of that, so I want to steer as far clear of that as I possibly can. So verse 4, does he not see my ways and count my every step? Verse 5, if I have walked in falsehood or my foot has hurried after deceit, let God weigh me in honest scales and He will know that I am blameless. That's the way a heart that craves righteousness wants to be. I know that God sees what is invisible. I know God sees what is not revealed to the rest of the world. I know that God sees my ways, counts my every single step, and I want to be blameless in front of God. It's the heart and mind of a righteous person that keeps a person righteous. And so Jesus' first lesson, Jesus' first lesson in not worshiping the old way of the written code, but the new way of the Spirit, the first lesson is don't make it about the sin itself. Put a fence around that sin and in your heart and in your mind stay as far away from that sin as possible because we know that God searches our hearts. This interaction, when we take the seriousness of God, Job understood the seriousness of God. This morning in Bible class, we were studying the flood that was brought in the days of Noah. And the Bible told us that Noah was righteous and blameless in the eyes of God. But everybody else in the world was wicked, and so God destroyed all of the wicked people. You know, it takes a while for us to recognize the reality that in this life, we can, we can, uh, we can schmooze people. We can trick our parents. We can trick our godparents. We can appear on the outside to be a certain kind of person. And we can deceive people. But the Bible, there is this very real message in the Bible that you can't deceive God. God hates what is wicked, loves what is upright and righteous. And so these ideas have far-reaching consequences, how they affect our own 
life, uh, how they affect how we raise our children. Because if God doesn't even want us to tolerate anger or rage, several other places in the Scripture, then when we see our children acting out of anger and rage, we've got to put a stop to that. We've got to teach them and train them and work with them, but they need to understand that anger and rage has no place in the life. I once, (laughs) I'm sure you've all seen this, but I'll give you one example. I remember seeing two kids uh, playing with an item. I I think it was a, a, a smartphone, actually. It was a phone. And one of the kids was playing with the phone and the other kid wanted the phone. And this kid obviously says, no. So he's playing with the phone and this kid wanted the phone, no. And this kid finally quit asking, stood up and took the phone. And this kid, <laughs> he, what you saw, you saw a rage come over his eyes and he opened his mouth and showed his teeth. You know what he wanted to do? He wanted to bite. He, the, the, the greatest amount of pain that he could recognize to inflict on that other boy was to bite him. He wanted to grab a hold and bite that kid. I'm sure you've all seen that kind of rage and anger in little kids, but that has got to be stopped. That has got to be disciplined out of the children because God is saying men will discipline you for murdering. But God is saying, I will discipline you for merely being angry. We should get a hold of those ideas. You know, I couldn't help but reflect on this. And uh, it also applies to our government and our uh, police and our prosecutors. I want to tell you about a grave, grave sin that is happening in our world right now. And God absolutely forbids it. But our police and prosecutors, somebody, I don't know who's in control of the situation, but they're saying if somebody steals, as long as it's less than $1,000, let them get away with it. Don't chase them. Don't prosecute them. Up to $1,000, let's go ahead and let people steal. If someone comes up behind somebody and sucker punches them, They can be knocked out, they can have their jaw broke, and that criminal is back out on no bail, back out on the streets. We have all noticed in our last couple of years that the laws of the lands have been very relaxed. Nobody wants to punish a criminal. And so people have become weak, people have become spineless in exacting the wrath of God on people who are breaking the law. That is what God wants. Everybody wants to be kind and compassionate and give second chances, but that's not what God wants. Let me take you to Romans chapter 13 and verse 4. God has made it very clear the purpose of the government, the purpose of your city council, your prosecutors and your police, the purpose is to praise you guys that are doing a good job at being righteous. But the other purpose is for them to exact the wrath of God on people who are breaking the law. Let me read it to you, Romans 13 and verse 4. The one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. Because rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. When something happens in a house, mom and dad might want to just gloss over it and kind of ignore it. But when someone breaks a law, God has demanded of His servants, His agents, the police, the prosecutors, He has demanded that you execute execute the wrath of God on that lawbreaker. Why is that so important? The Scriptures say that when the punishment for a crime is not quickly carried out, the hearts of men will be filled with all kinds of evil schemes. You take a child that is not disciplined, what does that child's heart become full of? He can get away with murder, and so they do. And God says, do not let that happen. 
drive discipline far, I mean, drive rebellion far away from the heart of a child and far away from the heart of a lawbreaker, how do you drive it out? By being an agent of wrath to bring about the wrath of God on the lawbreaker. And this becomes more and more obvious, more and more clear. People are confused today because psychology has retrained parents. Psychology has retrained our police force. You know, I asked uh, one officer, do you guys remember that policemen used to wear a, uh, a billy club? They used to could slide that thing out and they could kind of pound it on their hand and that would be a warning. You're pushing my patience. It's about to get real ugly if you keep pushing. They're not allowed to carry anything like that anymore. As a matter of fact, they don't, want even, they don't even want cops carrying guns anymore. Have you seen the images of the riot police and their masks and these young teenagers are in their face, spitting in their face, cussing out these cops, and the cops are told to do nothing? When God tells us, I'll judge that teenager even for having angriness in their heart and mind, those policemen should be bringing down the wrath of God on anyone that exudes lawlessness. That's what Jesus makes clear. Jesus wants us to be in control of our heart and our mind long before it ever results in any kind of physical manifestation. Well, let me... I gave you Romans 13. Uh, he finishes out our text in Matthew 5. Let me just kind of draw this to a conclusion. Uh, to impress the importance of driving out this anger from our hearts and our minds because God doesn't tolerate even anger, He says when you do that, to finish out our verses, He's going to give two examples of urgency. You need to deal with your anger urgently. Don't put it off. Don't let it fester. In one scripture, he says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. But Jesus is going to give two examples of urgency. Uh, let's look at them together. Matthew chapter 5, roughly verse 23. I'm just going to paraphrase this. Uh, he says, if you're offering your gift at the altar, leave your gift there and then go be reconciled first to your brother. I'm going to talk about that. The second one is in verse 25. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court. Now, unfortunately, sometimes we take both of those and people have made their life extra hard by going, oh boy, before I put my donation in the plate, I better do an analysis to see if I'm angry at anybody, right? In the church, we've kind of promoted that as saying, before you take the Lord's Supper, you better make sure you're not angry with anybody. I, I don't think that's what Jesus meant for us to, to, to go there, especially with the second idea. The second idea is in that first century, someone could merely make an accusation against you, take you to court, and steal all of your personal wealth. It happened to the Christians a lot in one of the books of the Bible. They have taken your you have given up your physical property, he says. And so there's this idea that he says, man, when somebody accuses you of something, resolve it with them before you ever get to court. Otherwise, when you get to court, they're going to take everything you have. So these are not two examples of saying, here is when you need to remember to deal with your anger. They're two examples that deal with urgency. Can you imagine what it would be like if you had gone all the way to Jerusalem, gone all the way to the temple, and you've brought your lamb as your offering to sacrifice it, and he says, ooh, before you offer that lamb, leave it there and go back. Who knows how far it was from your house to Jerusalem? Go back to your house, reconcile yourself, and then come back and get your sheep. And what I picture that as being is, how would you feel if you had left your lamb tied up somewhere in the temple and you leave to go fix something? Do you feel the urgency? I, I need to get back to the lamb. I need to take care of this quickly. In my mind, it's kind of like, you've probably never done this, but you know how you uh, gave your children little baths when they were babies? You gave them a little bath and then the phone would ring. 
And maybe you did or didn't, but if you went to go answer the phone, you would have that sense of urgency, a sense of needing to hurry up because I've got a baby in the bathwater. I can't leave that baby in the bathwater. I got to hurry. So your phone call is kind of in a rush. And I think that's what God, what Jesus is teaching them here is feel a sense of urgency in diffusing your anger. That's very important. <clears throat> the new way of worshiping in the Spirit is to reflect on our heart and mind. That is where the seat of righteousness is. I want to encourage you guys to be very aware of that and to do that. Uh, there's a story in the Bible about, well, there are lots of stories about how God looks at righteous people. The people that are working on this uh, walking according to the Spirit, uh, we know that God saved Noah because he was this kind of a guy. Uh, we know that God blessed uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth with John the Baptist because the Bible says they were righteous and blameless. Uh, God chose Mary because Mary was righteous and blameless. God's love goes out to those who are righteous and blameless, but God's wrath goes out to people who do wickedness. I want to show you this, Psalm 34 and verse 15, which one of these two people do you want to be? Psalm 34 and verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous and His ears towards their cry. Verse 16, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. I hope you find yourself craving the first person. I want the Lord to be pleased with me. I want the Lord to be happy with me. I want the Lord to see me as blameless so that His eyes will always be towards me so that He'll hear my cry. I hope you belong to that first group there. Uh, it reminded me of... Uh, uh, a verse in the book of Daniel, uh, and then I'll close with this, guys. Uh, Daniel was shown favor through one of the most horrible times Jerusalem ever experienced. Uh, Jerusalem had been wicked. Jerusalem had been sinful. Babylon came into Jerusalem, destroyed it, burned it to the ground, and the first people they took back to Babylon was Daniel... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, some of these handsome, educated young men is what the Bible says. At a time when uh, Jerusalem was burning and people were being killed, da Daniel and his friends were shown favor. They were taken back to uh, Babylon. They were educated in Babylon and they were promoted to the highest places of government in Babylon. And the Bible says that God had the Babylonians show favor towards Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because he was a righteous man and a blameless man. So Daniel has known that the 70 years in Babylon is supposed to be over. Daniel had read Jeremiah. And so he was going to God and saying, God, we should be going back to Jerusalem. We should be rebuilding the temple because our 70 years of punishment are over. And so how does Daniel approach God when he says that? He begins to pray. He begins to fast. He begins to seek God. And if you read it, I would read Daniel chapter 9. You can turn there with me. Daniel chapter 9. But I would read how Daniel prays in Daniel chapter 9. He says, God, forgive us. We've been wicked. We've been evil. We've done all the wrong things. And you are proven righteousness. It's been proven that the way you disciplined us was righteous and just because it is obvious that we have been evil. We have deserved everything you've sent to us. But Daniel wants to turn it around and he says, but now, Father, forgive us. You are right. I was wrong. 
forgive me. Daniel turns his heart to God and look at how God answers. Or they, Actually, this is an angel that gets sent to Daniel. Daniel 9 and verse 23. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out and I have come to tell it to you because you are greatly loved. I would put a square around those words. God sent an angel to tell Daniel, you are greatly loved. God loves you, Daniel, because of your humility, your repentance. You are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Daniel, I've seen you repent. I've heard your prayer. Daniel, you are greatly loved. Well, that's just the first uh, one of the phrases in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. You have heard this, but I tell you to do this. And we'll put a pin right there and we'll follow up with that uh, in the following sermons. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, uh, what words out of heaven that we as your creation have witnessed and realized, Father. Realize that sin is not what happens on the outside of the body with our hands, with our members of our body, with our eyes. That sin happens long before that. That sin is cultivated in our heart and in our mind. And Jesus demanded that that's where our purity and righteousness comes from from our heart and our mind, to put a fence around the sin that would grieve You, Father, and to keep us far from it instead of trying to creep up as close to it as possible. Father, praise Your holy name for these words of enlightenment. Bless Your saints here at Westside, Lord, that we can manifest this righteousness so that the whole world will recognize Your mercy in our lives and desire that same mercy in their own life. It's these things in Christ's name we pray. Amen.